Argonaut Manufacturing Services is a contract manufacturing organization serving the biopharma, life sciences, and molecular diagnostic industries. Argonaut is proud to partner with Enlorum and make an impact on the lives of nano-rare disease patients. To learn more about Argonaut and the services that they provide to organizations like Enlorum, please visit ArgonautMS.com. Hello, folks. This is Stan Crook. I'm the chairman and CEO of Enlorum, and I'm your host uh, for the Enlorum podcast series. Today, as our special guest, we have Wayne Woodward. Wayne is the CEO of Argonaut. Argonaut is one of the many um, uh, support firms that have been true great partners for us and real supporters. And so uh, we'll get an opportunity to talk about what Wayne's organization is doing for us a little bit later in the podcast. Wayne, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Stan. I, it's it's an honor to to spend some time with uh, a legend. And really, uh, we're really, really happy to to support you and, and all you're doing with the N. Lorem Foundation. Well, I'll give you a quick piece of advice. Don't listen to all those bad things people say about me, OK? <laughs> yeah, the old, there's not many of those out there. <laughs> well, uh, Wayne, I, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that I think our listeners, listeners will find very interesting today is seeing how uh, your organization and what you do fits into the whole scheme of things that have to happen uh, sort of in the back room of, of drug discovery and development. Um, and and um, of, of course, you're, you're CEO of a, of a component of a manufacturing process. And uh, I know that you've been involved in manufacturing your whole career in one way or another. And uh, and but I have to confess, I, I don't know what a BS in industrial technology is, <laughs> but uh, maybe you can help me with that. Yeah, it's uh, well, it's interesting that you you mentioned it, Stan. It, it, if you uh, I'm old enough to go back further than the supply chain was actually called the supply chain. Uh-huh. At one point in time, a lot of industrial engineering and industrial technology uh, focused groups within universities were building out basically that whole concept. And so before they used to call it supply chain, um, the, a lot of industrial engineers or, or industrial technologists like myself um, focused on this whole concept of everything planning, sourcing, manufacturing and delivering of products that people need. Um, and uh, many of my colleagues um, do very much the same kind of thing in an operating role. So where I'm not a, a scientist, I'm more focused on the engineering side. Um, most of our career, most of my career has been spent in this operational type of role. Mm-hmm. And that, and your degree was at San Jose State. So you're yep. a California uh, native, I guess. Born and raised here. Yes, yes, exactly. Well, uh, you've made some smart decisions staying and moving down to San Diego. That's, Absolutely. Uh, that shows good thinking. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, how, how did you come by being interested in in that particular side of, of the business world? Well, you know, one of the things that I just truly love to do is um, I've always loved making things. I've always enjoyed being involved in that in that process, um, and you know, for me, um, not being that sort of innovator, that creator, that 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 has that genius and capability, like yourself, to 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 visualize, um, you know, really amazing things that you've created in your life. Um, I think, um, you know, my my whole thought was to be a a supporter of people like that. So, from the beginning of my career, I've always focused on helping and assisting innovators and creators to to bring their ideas to life, to give them the ability to put them into a manufacturing environment, to make them actually um, repeatably and reliably in a high quality way. So um, this is just something I started in my career, started off in that world and um, never left it. I just enjoy it more, more so today than I probably did almost 36 years ago now. That's a sign you picked the right thing to do, right? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, I will say you're just a little overly modest. 
Uh, it takes a ton of innovation to do all the things that you do. Um, so it, it, without, without what, what you do, no drug is going to happen. So, and, and lots of things have changed in my many, many years of doing this. And, and those are all products of innovators in, in the manufacturing space. And so well, thank you. It, you know, yeah. modesty over overly being being overly modest is probably a good a good idea. It's something I haven't done very well in my life. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe I'll take a lesson from you. Uh, and uh, I know that before you joined Argonaut, you were you were president of, of global uh, supply chain or whatever it is at Thermal Fisher. Yeah, as vice president of global supply chain for the life sciences group. And uh, there, and then at Life Technologies before that. Yeah. And those are businesses that really are providing the chemistry, the chemicals, the reagents that are necessary for biological and pharmacologically and drug, drug discovery and that sort of thing. So that's really a very different industry from actually being a, a, a significant part of, of making a drug possible. Um, so how, how, what what excited you about that move? What connects them to? Yeah. It, it, well, you know, if you think about um, what we are really what we do here at Argonaut in terms of not only do we provide the drug product capability and the drug product fill finish capability, but we also have a, a significant amount of investment in our company into the diagnostic component um, uh, of that market. And that's really my strength. Um, that's where I came from in that in terms of. Uh, my background, um, what we saw was such a corollary between um, the concepts of creating contract manufacturing capability, which the biopharma industry has led life sciences in, in, in that maturing of that market um, uh, to, to enable contract manufacturing as, as, a, as a capability and as a true market. The diagnostic life sciences side wasn't as far advanced. And so leveraging the team of people we have who understood the contract manufacturing environment. I came from a space prior to life sciences in the computer and electronics industry and semiconductor equipment that was very, very familiar with that in a modern supply chain. But the diagnostic life sciences side wasn't so much. So we needed to marry people who understood and had experience in contract manufacturing with this new market on the diagnostic life sciences side. So bringing those two pieces together, working with a few people here in the San Diego area that had a lot of background and experience in this, we were able to bring these two components of business together all under one roof and support not only the folks that deliver, you know, solutions from a from a biopharmaceutical perspective, but also those folks who help us figure out what's wrong with people in the diagnostic space. Yeah. And I'm going to uh, in the next phase of our conversation, focus on what Argonaut does and what you, how important you are to what we are are, try, are accomplishing. But before I do that, I want to just spend a couple of minutes um, describing sort of the steps for, for folks, because I think there are very few people other than those of us who live in the industry who recognize how many steps, how many regulated steps, how costly those steps are between having a drug that you you want to provide a patient and actually being able to do it. So if you forgive me, I'll just spend a minute talking yeah. about the steps in Anasense and comparing that to some other uh, platforms for drug discovery. So uh, all of these things that I'm about to talk about are sort of in the back room. That and nobody really ever talks about them much, but without them, there ain't no drugs. And so, uh, with with Anasense, uh, things were a little simpler because we can use shared solutions to manufacturing formulation and so on. But once we have um, a, a, an ASO that we think can help a patient, the first step is we have to make it, and uh, and 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 we we have we put a, a good many contract manufacturers for ASOs in into business and we also have the capability of doing it ourselves and that first uh, batch of, of ASO we make we make in a small quantity and that's then sufficient 
to do animal studies and 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 then we have to go back to the drawing board and and make the same ASO but in a very different way um, that's called uh, uh, GMP manufacturing. We'll talk a little bit about what good manufacturing practices is, but uh, it certainly is a, a, a regulatory driven step and it's costly and time consuming. And then um, we have to think about formulating it. And you know we're lucky there too, because for our applications, our formulations are just basically saline. Uh, that's not the case for most drugs. And then we need to, um, uh, when we're ready to go to the clinic, um, put that in a form that a physician can use to administer the medicine. And uh, and since our drugs are parenteral, that means that that step has to be sterile. And so we'll be talking about sterile fill finish and what, that, what actually that is. Um, if you think about more traditional drugs like small molecules, say your Lipitor, when that was first discovered, the next step was to spend millions of dollars and, and probably two years figuring out how to make it cheaply on scale. We don't have to do that. We solved that problem. And then the next step was to look at all the different formulations that needed to be made. Um, and 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 finally, then a drug in a pill or in a bottle gets done. Uh, and so, one of the benefits that the technology offered was this uh, potential to solve problems that have to be solved every time you make a new medicine, but solve them once for all of them. And that makes um, anesthesia technology much more efficient in, in many ways. And um, and uh, if you were to compare this to gene therapy or to protein therapy like monoclonal antibodies, again, the challenges there are vastly greater, both in manufacturing and in how you how you deliver that manufactured product to 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 the patient. And um, um, these steps that are rarely discussed, each one of them is critical and there it's in a series it's not parallel if you can't do one step the whole thing is over right and and they and these steps are all highly regulated uh, and so they take time and they cost a lot of money um, and when you're looking for how all the costs in a medicine come to pass a bunch of the cost is in these steps now <clears throat> Um, with Argonaut, of course, um, you're our um, provider of what, what is called sterile fill finish. Uh, maybe you can help our help our friends understand what the heck that means, really. Yeah, yeah. So, so great, great explanation, Stan, of the overall process. So, when that drug substance is ready to be put into um, the container that will ultimately be delivered to a doctor's office or a hospital or wherever that might be um, uh, administered. Um, and it is a parenteral like these, of course, um, you know, this whole process has to be be done in a very controlled fashion in an, uh, in an operation that more and more today and certainly within our operation here is, is almost completely automated everything from providing a vial into um, a sterile environment in, in an open in an open form uh, then actually filled the drug substances being filled um, being weight checked to make sure that we actually got it right a couple times um, before we stopper it um, all that activity occurs in what we call now in today's modern you know fill finish line is an isolator and an isolator is basically a a, a scaled down version of a room that used to be completely sterile. And now we just keep everything inside of the system very close to that, that, that material that we're filling for and Lauren, very, very clean and in a very sterile environment. It's easier to control a smaller environment, but it does have its limitations because now we're not able to touch things with our hands anymore. We have to rely on automation. We have to rely on, on, on uh, software that that controls all of this process for us in a in, in, in a process that is monitored you know 
hundreds and hundreds of sensors throughout the system monitoring everything from airflow to um, keeping tabs on how uh, how much material was loaded into each of these vials. And then when vials are not good, how are they handled or how are we how do we take them out of the process? Um, all that stuff a lot of folks used to do by hand, but now all that's done in a very much in a very state of the art uh, design system that we have here at Argonaut um, for the folks at, 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 and all of our all the patients at Enlorem. So each one of those vials gets filled, it gets weight checked, it gets checked again for, from a quality perspective. Then we finish it um, by stoppering it and, and sealing it. And then the last step is every single one of those vials is visually inspected. And so that visual inspection process, very, very difficult to do. You're looking for anything that might have gone wrong. And it's very, very rare we find them, but when, if there is anything in there, we know how to catch it. And then we know what to do with working with Enlorem to, to just position the lot and what we should do about that, given what we find, or if we find anything at all. Um, but the process is highly regulated. So everything from what somebody does to make sure that the room is prepared correctly, what we do to make sure that the, the, the instruments are sterilized properly, all the way through the, the, the manufacturing process, all the way out to the back, uh, where, of that machine where the system will uh, push those those vials out into the room, which is also still in a, in a in a very clean facility in of itself. But once it's pushed back out into there and then into visual inspection and all the way out to to you folks here at the at Edelmo, at, at N. Lorem. Yeah, it's um, obviously we we want our drugs to be sterile, and the world isn't sterile. There yeah. are all kinds of infectious agents that uh, are around. And in the old days, like you said, we tried to make the whole of a room completely right. sterile. And innovators uh, like yourself found a solution that works better, which is to close the systems in a clean room and, and then, of course, test. One thing that you uh, didn't mention uh, is so, so, sort of the GMP record keeping. Uh, yeah. Test. Right. So our whole facility is operates under um, CGMP. And so what that stands for is continuous good manufacturing practice. And it's a it, it's at the cornerstone. It is a cornerstone in, of the foundation here at Argonaut that we provide customers with that level of quality and, and, and match those expectations, um, not only at, um, you know, what, the, what the, the Food and Drug Administration of the United States asks for, but what the world asks for in terms of um, a, a, a quality management system that monitors and manages each component and each element of this process in a tremendous amount of detail. So we have this concept of what we call a batch record um, the batch record is could be 300 pages long um, for some of these some of these projects, and they they involve every component is being monitored, captured. Um, it's associated with a lot number that is created to you know to to track and trace all of this. But but more importantly, what CGMP really represents is an attitude that we all understand the seriousness of. Um, how important it is that what we're delivering to, you know, ultimately our patients is is of the highest quality and and possible traceability than, and uh, that's necessary, or but not just necessary. It's what we want to do, um, and we want to make sure that everything is right for every patient. Yeah, yeah, and um, of course you have to do many tests, but one test I probably want to single out is endotoxin. Yeah. Uh, endotoxin is a real pest, and endotoxin is a material that some bacteria make. And endotoxin, if it's if there's too much of it, can certainly do harm to a human being. And uh, uh, and in, in my experience, endotoxin is always a pain. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it's hard to measure and it's hard to keep it out. Yeah. Uh, uh, you want to just talk about how you how you manage all that? Sure. Yeah. So, like you said, there are a host of QC steps or quality control steps that are used throughout this process to you know ensure the sterility, to test for endotoxins, 
to test for any any form of um, a, a, a substance that nobody wants in anywhere near what we're we're working with. Um, those also, you know, all, the, those tests are also a part of a whole raft of tests that, that, that deal with just some of the basics of what was built or what was delivered to us, the drug substance that was delivered to us. Is it accurate before it goes in? And then is it accurate as it comes out um, or is really the goal, right? So we have those handoffs and those what we call QC steps all throughout the process. Um, and, you know, what does it take to keep the endotoxin? It takes an incredible amount of detailed um, focus on cleanliness and keeping the, the environment, you know, free of any kind of endotoxins that we can, uh, you know, avoid um, and or any other kind of uh, substance we don't want near this, near these products. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of effort goes into that. Um, and a lot of people get, you know, spend hours and hours getting trained to know how to handle this stuff correctly, what to do, what not to do. If you've got a sniffle, what do you do? You know, I mean, people are people, right? But that's the other, the other advantage of the isolator is so much of it is done inside of that captured environment. We're taking more and more of the people out of that process. Yeah. And that, and that really has been a very fundamental step. And quality control tests uh, will consume dollars, time, and a lot of drug. Yeah. And so uh, for our folks who want to understand this a little better, uh, we have to make quite a bit more of the ASO than we're going to need uh, to treat a, a patient or a bunch of patients because uh, many of those vials are siphoned off at various places and times for these quality control tests that assure that our patients are getting a high quality uh, medication. So start to finish, when, 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 we, um, when we give you a, a, an ASO to, to mm -hmm. put these vials, how long does that take? Well, you'd be really surprised how quickly it actually gets accomplished once we put the, the drug substance onto the machine. That, that goes pretty fast. The prep work, the amount of uh, of information that's required takes several weeks. I mean, we're talking, you know, anywhere between eight to 12 weeks worth of hard work by the whole team working with the Enlorem team on when the material will arrive, what is required to pass the, the, the various QC steps that we want to get accomplished, scheduling it into the line, preparing the campaign to be actually produced, and then ultimately producing it and then finishing it up all the paperwork that's associated with the batch release. So not only, you know, when we're done with this, there's a whole audit process of what we have actually just done to make sure that everything was done according to plan. There was a perform by and a verify by on almost every step of the process. Um, everything is, um, is very uh, detailed. Let's put it that way. So all, when we're done with all of that, um, you know, that's when we would hand that product off to the next the, the, the next level in the supply chain and, and it would move on to the NLORM folks. Yeah. So one of the questions that I'm asked frequently is why just do we need 18 months? Yeah. Of course, I find that shockingly funny since uh, this process would nor just you know, in commercial drug development, we think in decades, right. <laughs> certainly not months, but but there are some very, there are some finite steps that just require time. Yeah. And one of them is this, up to about 12 weeks. And, and of course, we look, uh, uh, we have to coordinate each of these steps with each of our vendors. And so it's very important that we have um, partners with whom we communicate well and who understand the urgency of our needs because all of our patients are extremely sick. Yeah. Yeah. We, you know, we appreciate more than you'll ever know um, how important it is to, to get these drugs that you're working on um, stand with the Enlorem foundation to get these into these people's hands as, as quickly and as safely as pro as possible. And, you know, we we completely understand we we, dot, we block out some time for for the Enlorem Foundation each quarter and 
try to make sure we can do anything we can if, if we can to pull some stuff in for you. But we can never compromise on ultimately the quality because we do completely understand um, what it might mean um, to have a problem. And we don't want a problem because we know that problems will take time and time is not something that these patients have. Yeah. Without getting into the specifics of the price, the cost, uh, I would uh, say thank you once again for the two things. One, saving some time for us so we can get our patients treated as rapidly as possible. And the discounts that you're giving us uh, in, in, in your overall cost structure. And uh, while I appreciate that greatly and understand why, um, I, I think our, our our listeners would really enjoy hearing why you take potential profits from your company and 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 actually donate those profits to me and, yeah. to, and to Enlarm. Yeah. Well, well, Stan, you know, we we started talking together about two years ago on this project. Um, and I was struck um, personally by what you were doing and how special it is to help people that a lot of people don't give a lot of hope to. Um, and I think what you're doing is amazing. And um, we really feel honored to be a part of what you do uh, and what your whole organization is focused on and what they fo what they deliver. So when we talked about this um, almost two years ago, um, you know, we just said, this is our way to give back and pay it forward a little bit because you never know. And, and, and we know that those parents that never believed that this would be an issue or that would be a problem. But if we can pay it forward, um, this whole entire organization here at Argonaut um, feels really honored to be a part of what you guys do. So um, that's why we did it, um, because we really do uh, see the ultimate benefit of what you're doing as being um, more important necessarily than, you know, the making the profits that that we could potentially make on those slots. But we're not interested in that. That's really us just paying it forward a little bit in this world where I think everybody could probably use a little bit of that. Yeah, that's wonderful. And it is the mission in a nutshell. Uh, and every one of our partners tell us the same thing. It's a mission and that uh, working with NLARM is a great thing for employee engagement and commitment. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. Our team is so proud of what we do there. We, we had that opportunity last summer to go uh, do the 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 five t 5K walk. I think it was walk, jog. A couple of people were running pretty fast, but not me. Um, but they... And, and having a chance to meet a family there was so special for everybody. It was really a, a great experience. By the way, I, I've been meaning to send you a couple of videos of some patients who are doing remarkably well that awesome. you can share with. I would with, love that here. Yeah. I'll, do, I'll do it when we get off. Okay, wonderful. Well, I, I hope uh, everyone has learned a little bit about what goes on in that black box. Uh, Wayne, is there any question I haven't asked or anything? Oh, you've done a great job. Answer? Yeah, you did a great job, Stan, um, as always. But uh, well, thank you for the opportunity to to talk with you today a little bit and share some of what we think about and when we think about the Unlarm Foundation and, and how important it is to, to Argonaut. We appreciate it greatly, Wayne. And um, thank you and all your team for helping us help these patients. And uh, Our pleasure. without you. And we are doing it with you. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye now. Bye. And Lorem is a nonprofit committed to discovering and providing personalized experimental treatments for free for life to patients with genetic diseases that affect one to 30 patients worldwide, referred to by Enlorem as nano rare. Many of these patients progress and die without ever achieving a diagnosis. This is where Enlorm comes in. They do the impossible by providing hope and for those that they can help, free lifetime treatment. For more information about Enlorm or today's episode, visit enlorum.org. Any questions can be sent into podcast at enlorum.org. Search Enlorm on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook 
to connect with us. This video is hosted by Dr. Stan Crook and produced with the help of the following professionals. Thank you for watching.